Awesome. We're, we're going to get into uh, Luke 19 this morning. Uh, so it's uh, verses 1 through 10 is where we'll be uh, uh, focusing. And, uh, you know, the, the, the whole set of events, in the previous passage, there was a whole set of events that happened uh, with, with Jesus and the, uh, the blind beggar. That was, that was last week that Alan took us through that. So in that passage, Luke told us that Jesus is approaching a city. He's approaching the city of Jericho. And so that, that whole set of events last week happened outside the city, which, which that makes sense because a blind beggar would often be found outside the city as an outcast. And so, so then in the beginning of our passage today, Luke tells us that he enters Jericho. And so and as he goes into Jericho, he's going to talk to another outcast inside the city, but not the same type of outcast as uh, the beggar. So we're going to see that as we go, that the, an outcast in that culture was not just someone who was poor or sick. Now, there were, there were a few different kinds of outcasts. Now, today's passage is unique. If you've, uh, if you've, if you've peeked at it or if, if you're seeing it right now, you know that this passage is unique. Today's passage is unique in that it has a song that's been written about it, a special song that has been written for it. And, and, and many of us know uh, the, the song about uh, Zacchaeus. And so what I'm going to do to just kick us off today, we're going to do a group, uh, a group uh, activity, okay? And we're going to sing the song of Zacchaeus. And uh, so kids especially, if you know this song, I want to hear you singing out. All right? I don't want to hear these kids, but I want everybody singing out, okay? All right, so sing with me. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in that sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down for I'm coming to your house today. For I'm coming to your house today. Excellent. Give yourselves a hand. That was excellent. Y'all sounded really, really good. Now, I, I was, I was, this song obviously came to mind as I was thinking through this passage. Um, but I, I realized that that's not the end of the story. Have you ever noticed that? <laughs> this really only tells the first half of the story. And honestly, if you just kind of leave it here, it's uh, kind of a lame story. <laughs> honestly, it's just, it's just about Jesus inviting himself over for dinner in maybe kind of an annoying way. Uh, so I, I uh, wrote a second verse to it to kind of finish out the story. And so you can tell me if this. So uh, Jesus went into his house and they all ate some food. And as they ate, Zacchaeus said, I'm sorry, I've been rude. And he said, I've stolen, but I'll give it all back. Because I have new life today. Because I have new life today. So I thought that might kind of complete the whole story. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can change children's lives forever with that one. Uh, good. So we have the whole story. Now, now let's actually go to God's word. Uh, maybe we should have read God's word first and then sing this song. But <laughs> Luke 19, 1 through 10. Let's, uh, let, let's re read this from God's word. This will be from the English Standard Version. Uh, he, Jesus, entered Jericho and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. And he was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled, he has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he also was the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. So you see, there is a full, there's, there's a fuller story than the, the uh, original a song gives us, and so much, there's so much richness in this passage. Here's the big idea we're going to keep coming back to. Jesus seeks out sinners, and he calls them to repentant faith. Jesus seeks out sinners, and he calls them to repentant faith. And this statement right here is at the very heart of the gospel, that God does not leave us in our sins, but he initiates a relationship with us. Like, his call comes to us before our, our call goes to him. 
We, we, we need to see that. His call comes to us before our call of response goes uh, to him. We're going to look at this passage today based on the experience of Zacchaeus, since that's, that's what Luke focuses on. He kind of tells it from Zacchaeus' uh, perspective. What we see from Luke's telling of these events is that Zacchaeus did, he did three things. Zacchaeus sought out Jesus, Zacchaeus received Jesus, and then Zacchaeus responded to Jesus. So there's really just there's three verbs that are, that are important here. Sought, received, and responded. An- another way of stating this is that Zacchaeus had an open head, an open heart, and open hands. Right? An open head, he, he sought out Jesus. He had the thought, I, I want to seek out this Jesus guy. And he had an open heart when he received Jesus, and open hands as he responded to Jesus. And we saw it played out in his life. One last interesting note before we dive in further is that this is the only place in Scripture that we find this story. Zacchaeus is not in any of the other three Gospels. And it also has many of the elements that we have seen repeatedly in the book of Luke. It has, it has the presence of riches and what to do about it. If you've been with us for the book of Luke, we've seen that come up repeatedly. The presence of riches, uh, what to do about it. Uh, people's frustration about Jesus associating with people who are outcasts in the culture. That's another thing that has come up repeatedly. Luke, uh, he, he really focuses on how Jesus reaches out to those who are outcast in the culture. A uh, third one is how faith leads to repentance and transformation from death to life. Like there's faith in Jesus, but it, but it, it shows itself in some particular ways. We see all of that in this passage. In many ways, this passage really could be a central passage for the whole book of Luke. And so let's look at Zacchaeus and his open head, his open heart, and his open hands. And as we'll go, we're, at, we're also going to see, as, as we see Zacchaeus move through these, sta- these stages, Jesus also uh, responds and Jesus interacts with him too. So we're going to see both of these things. But So let, let's look at how Zacchaeus sought out Jesus. He had an open head, right? Open mind. So we, and we know pretty quickly that Zacchaeus is interested in Jesus. And so before we, we go a little further into the sought out particularly, we know he was seeking out Jesus Let's look at some other things that we know about Zacchaeus. What does Luke tell us? Let's see if this adds up uh, to anything. Because in in only 10 verses, Luke actually gives us a lot of detail about uh, Zacchaeus. Uh, One is that Zacchaeus was a tax collector. This is the first thing that uh, Luke tells us about Zacchaeus. Not only was he a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector. Now, we don't know exactly what the word chief being attached to the role of tax collector means. This is actually the only time in the New Testament that this, this phrase chief tax collector, this title is used. But it, it's safe to say, it's safe to guess, I think, that he had probably had some sort of authority over other tax collectors, some sort of super, maybe supervisory role over other tax collectors. And we've talked about tax collectors before in Luke. Now, these were usually Jewish men whose job it was to, to collect money, taxes, from the Jewish people to give to their Roman oppressors. Suffice it to say, they were not popular men. Uh, I, I was thinking just kind of how can we maybe uh, understand this and maybe feel this a little more viscerally today. So to put it in more modern terms, this past week uh, was June 6th. June 6th was uh, the anniversary of D-Day. This is the massive attack that the Allies in World War II, they carried out against the Germans in 1944. So this, this uh, year was the 80th anniversary of that attack. And essentially that battle was won at great risk and at great cost. Like thousands upon thousands of Americans, British, other allies, uh, they, they died on the beaches that day. But they, they basically took a step that essentially led to them winning the war that day. It was a really big deal that the tide of the war changed. Now, imagine though that the opposite had happened. Imagine for a second, alternate reality, the opposite had happened. Imagine that the Nazis won the battle of D-Day and that, that World War II uh, they, and they won World War II, and now Germans were now occupying America, and then, and then so in, including Texas. And let, just imagine that in, in Arlington and Fort Worth and Dallas, there were, there were Texans whose job it was was to take your money and give it to the occupying army. And your blood starts to boil a little bit, right? Our, our Texas pride really just starts to get us at that point, right? But that, that, that gives us a little bit of an understanding of, okay, this is, this is how the Jews might have viewed a tax collector, someone who was taking their money to give it to their Roman oppressors, but also taking too much and keeping it for himself and enriching himself in the process. Uh, N.T. Wright has a commentary on this, on on Luke and on this passage. He writes that the people of Jericho, they would have been horrified 
if they knew that 2,000 years later, Zacchaeus' name would be the only one that's known from the whole city, right? He, was not, he would not have been a popular person in that city. Now, note too, this is also not the only time. This is not the first time that Jesus has shown favor to a tax collector. In just the last chapter, chapter 18, Jesus tells a parable of two men who prayed, and the man who had a genuine heart who, who the Lord showed favor to was a tax collector. Now, as we mentioned, Zacchaeus was not just a tax collector, he was a chief tax collector, which meant he was super rich. He was rich because he cheated people out of their own money. This, this, this likely served to widen this, this gap that existed between him and the quote-unquote regular Jews, most of whom had contributed uh, involuntarily to his wealth. And so I, I, being a chief tax collector, you can kind of imagine there might have been this situation where he, got, he even got a piece of other tax collectors' gatherings. That's, that's possibly what was happening, which would have just made him wildly rich compared to those around him. Now, Luke also tells us this detail in this story that he was short. He was small in stature. So he was a rich tax collector, but also short. And this is a detail that Luke gives us probably because the detail about climbing a tree wouldn't make sense unless we knew that he couldn't see over the people in front of him. Now, I was, I was kind of intrigued by this. I was like, how, how short was Zacchaeus? How, how short might he have been? I didn't have much of a, of a frame of reference. So I did a little bit of research on the average height of a Jewish man in the first century. And that, there's a little bit of variation in the estimates, but it really seems like that the upper estimates for like an average or, or a tall person, a tall man in that time, would have been about 5'5", five, five, which is pretty wild compared to our, 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 uh, our height uh, today. This, mean, this means that Zacchaeus was almost certainly somewhere in the, in the four foot something range. And so I was still trying to like just kind of imagine that. So actually here, I, I might need a couple of volunteers to help me with this. Jason, can you come up here for a second? Volunteer might be a strong word. Voluntold might be a little <laughs> better. Jason, how tall are you? Four foot six. You come stand right here. Okay, Jason's four foot six. Uh, Kim, I didn't prepare you on this. Come on, what, what, how tall are you, Kim? Five feet. Okay, exactly, exactly. Good, good. So, so this is when, like an average height for a man in that time. And so Zacchaeus honestly would have been probably about this height, about as tall as Jason, maybe somewhere in between Jason and Kim. Thanks, y'all. Give them a hand. Yeah, appreciate it. Yes, excellent. That's pretty short. That's pretty short, especially if everybody else is six or eight inches taller than you. So in a crowd, Zacchaeus would not have been able to see Jesus. This was something that was a limitation for him. But there's something else that was true about Zacchaeus. So he's, he's a tax collector, he's rich, he's short, but also he was seeking Jesus. Zacchaeus was motivated to know Jesus more. He sought out Jesus. He had an open head. He had an open mind toward Jesus. Jesus, and see, Zacchaeus did not let something that limited him, his height, keep him from encountering Jesus. He, he did something that was outside of his comfort zone. I, I was thinking through this, like, what, what's, what's a modern-day equivalent to this? So Zacchaeus, he, he was physically short. Okay, that limited him from seeing Jesus, and so he took action. What's, what's a modern-day equivalent? Like, you want to see Jesus, you want to know him more, you want to encounter Jesus. I, I, I want to know Jesus more, but there's, there's a limitation. You feel limited somehow. I don't know, maybe, maybe thoughts like, I, man, I, I read my Bible, but I just don't seem to get anything out of it. I, maybe I don't understand it. Man, I, I have, I have these, these mental health struggles. I just don't know. It's, it's hard to do anything. I can't, I can't seem to just encounter Jesus. I have a crazy schedule. I, I, I work a lot. I'm, I'm taking classes. There's a lot that's going on. I have kids. Like, what is your limitation? What's the limitation in your life? What action maybe would help you but is intimidating to take because of how you will be perceived or, or maybe because of the inconvenience to you or maybe because it's just hard? Maybe is, is it asking for help? Is, is it getting and taking someone else's advice? Is it maybe adjusting the rhythms of your life, adjusting your schedule so that you can draw close to Jesus? Or, you know what, maybe, it, maybe it's just doing what the blind beggar did in the previous passage, just saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Maybe that's where you need to go to address this limitation in your life of encountering Jesus. Let, let, let this example of Zacchaeus here challenge you. He had a limitation of seeing Jesus, but he took action. Zacchaeus was rich, but he, he runs. He climbs a tree. He hurries down. All of those things, running, climbing trees, hurrying down, all of those things are things that a rich man would not do in that culture in order to maintain a sense of propriety. 
to maintain his reputation. Those are all things he would not to do. We, we saw this at the, uh, in, in the story of the, the prodigal son or the tale of two sons, right? The father, Jesus tells this tale, the father runs out to his younger son when his younger son returns to him. And to, to us, it's like, yeah, he was eager to get to him. But to that culture, that would have been, whoa, this, this landowner, prestigious older man runs? Okay, there, there's, there's something very strong. There is a love that is very strong there. And with, with Zacchaeus, there is a desire to know Jesus. Lord, help us to be more like Zacchaeus. Let's look at how Jesus responded to Zacchaeus as he's, he's seeking to know who Jesus was. So what does Jesus respond? Jesus saw Zacchaeus. So, so first of all, Luke tells us Jesus is entering Jericho, right? He, he's passing through to Jerusalem. This, this is near the end of this journey to Jerusalem that Jesus has been on since Luke 9. He's been on this journey to Jerusalem so Jesus is entering this city. Verse 5, Luke tells us he looks up. As he's entering Jericho, he looks up and he sees Zacchaeus in this tree. Now, in a second, we'll look at what Jesus says to him. But first, I just want to focus on the fact that Jesus, is, Jesus he notices someone, something, someone who others might not notice, who others have not noticed. This is the heart of Jesus. This is what Jesus does. Jesus notices People at the center, it's not just people at the center of the culture that he notices. It, it, it's not just the in crowd that Jesus notices. He's drawn to someone with an open mind, with an open heart to him. This is who he is drawn to. He's drawn to those who are seeking him, no matter their past lives, no matter their current status, no matter what their, their socioeconomic status is. He is drawn to them. He's literally in the middle of a crowd that's clamoring for his attention, but his attention is given to the guy at the back of the crowd who's desperately trying to see him. And what happens right here is that the seeker becomes the sought. You see that? Like, like Zacchaeus was the seeker. Zacchaeus was seeking to know Jesus. But in the middle, it flips. Luke tells us Jesus saw him. And that's when the roles were now reversed. Now, Zacchaeus is being sought by Jesus. We literally sang these words this morning. Come now, fount of every blessing, has the words, Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the folds of God. And no, we did not plan that. <laughs> Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the folds of God. Jesus sees Zacchaeus. And just to be clear, Jesus was seeking Zacchaeus before Zacchaeus was ever seeking Jesus. This is just the time when their physical bodies came close. Jesus sees the one who is open to him, and then he speaks to the one who is open to him. We've seen this before in the book of Luke. We have seen Jesus be open and, and, and draw close to the one who draws close to him. So in verse 5, what does Jesus say? Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he calls him to physically respond to this call. He gives him a physical action to respond. And then he invites himself over for dinner, which is great. Now, now remember, this is the first century. There's no Airbnb, okay? So as Jesus and his followers are traveling around, you know, he, he can't go to Peter and be like, hey, yeah, get on the app, let's get, let's get a house for tonight, you know, make sure it's got four bedrooms and a pool. No, it's not, that's not the way hospitality works. Like, one of the main ways that people would have shelter in a new town is by relying on the hospitality of others. So, so when Jesus invites himself over for dinner, that, that's not entirely out of left field as it might seem to us uh, today, especially since he is a popular figure. But notice what Jesus says. There's a word he uses, <clears throat> I must stay at your house today. I must stay at your house today. I, I was just, that, that word just kind of stuck out to me. It could be, could be a minor detail, but I thought it could be something. I was looking at this, the, the Greek word that's translated must here. The root word is, is deo. It's, it's, it's used over 40 times in the New Testament. Like m many of the other usages though, looking at other, other places that it's used really gives us a sense of what is happening here. Most of the other times that it's used, it's used to refer to something or someone who is being bound, imprisoned, or, or constrained in some way. Uh, another translation, the Christian Standard Bible, uh, translates Jesus' words here as, it is necessary that I stay at your house 
today. Like whatever the case is, Jesus' words here, that, that particular word carries a sense of inevitability. Like this is going to happen. I must stay at your house today. It is necessary that I stay at your house today. Because here's the thing. When Jesus calls you, there's no stopping his salvation. Okay, when, when, when Jesus is calling your heart, there is no stopping it. When the Jesus train is coming down the tracks, like get right or get wrecked. Like there, there is no stopping Jesus' salvation. We know from Ephesians 1, verse 5, that God had predestined Zacchaeus for adoption as his son. That's what Ephesians 1, 5 tells us. From before time began, we knew, Jesus knew that he was going to have this encounter with Zacchaeus and that Zacchaeus would respond to him. We can't run away from that. We sang at the end of the service uh, last week this song. Uh, in the, one of the verses of this song says, And in love before you laid the world's foundation, you predestined to adopt me as your own. You have raised me so high up above my station. I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone. So we certainly see the sovereignty of God on display here. We see that, yes, Jesus knew this was going to happen. He said, I must stay at your house today. And so amid this, this initiation of the sovereignty of God, we see the beautiful response and the human responsibility of response to Jesus' call. And so we see the open heart of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus received Jesus. And Luke tells us in verse 6, he describes it. He says, so he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, hurry. And Zacchaeus hurried. This is the action of a heart that is open to Jesus. This is the action of a heart that is already submitting to the lordship of Jesus in his life. And you know, the first chapter of the Gospel of John actually beautifully describes what is going on here. When, when John, who was a disciple of Jesus, a close disciple of Jesus, when he wrote that, that first part of the book of John, I, I wonder if Zacchaeus' story was on his mind when he wrote this. He would have been there with Jesus. John 1, 11 through 13 says, He, Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. This is what is happening here. Zacchaeus is receiving Jesus. He has an open heart to Jesus, and he becomes a child of God. This is the birth of new life. This is the birth of old things passing away and all, and all things becoming new in the life of Zacchaeus. It's the old self passing away. It's the new self coming into play. As amazing as this is, and just as wild as this is, and we can look back and say, wow, that's amazing. Not everyone thought that was amazing at this time. Verse 7, when they saw it, the crowd around them, when they saw it, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner. The, the they in verse 7, it's the crowd that followed Jesus. You know, and honestly, it often seems like that they're more curious about the novelty of his presence than the reality of his power. I think that's, that's what often characterizes this, this kind of uh, anonymous crowd that follows Jesus. They're like, wow, this guy is kind of wild. But they'll, they'll, but they'll complain. They'll kind of argue with him. And not really, you can tell their, their hearts are not really in it. They're not really responding to Jesus. But I, I want to try to put ourselves in their shoes for a moment, though. Not necessarily in doubting Jesus, but in the sense of viewing someone as unworthy of receiving something good. Uh, has that ever happened to you? Th think in your life, has that ever happened to you? Have you ever observed someone receive something good, and you've thought, they, they, don't, they don't deserve that. I, I know what they're really like. I, I should have gotten that thing and not them. This is the mindset of the older brother in the, in the tale of two sons that Jesus tells. I, I remember an experience in my life. I, I was a, a senior in high school. Uh, I traveled out to Longview, Texas uh, with a good friend to compete for a scholarship at the Laterno University. So two hours east on I-20, competing for the president's scholarship. They only gave it to 10 people each year. Me and my good buddy went out there. We thought we had a great chance uh, to get it. There were, uh, I forget how many were competing for it. It was more than 10 for sure. It could have been 30, 40, maybe even 50. There's, there's a good crowd that was competing for this. Uh, and I, I remember there was this one girl, and her name was, her name was Summer Brown. And she introduced herself. Uh, she said, uh, she talked very 
high-pitched and very quick and said, hi, my name is Summer Brown. It's not Autumn Red because my name is Summer Brown. Nice to meet you. And she just had an energy about her that it kind of grated on me, honestly. It was, it was very difficult to, to be around her. I uh, just thought, wow, she, she's a lot. But, you know, me and my friend, we smiled. We played nice. We, was just, we got to know people while we were there. We go through the whole weekend. It was fun. Uh, we went home. We thought, yeah, we think we have a good chance. Uh, we later heard, a couple weeks later, we got our results back. And neither of us got the president's scholarship. But uh, through communication with other people, we learned that, yes, Summer Brown had gotten the scholarship. And, uh, you know, we were just kind of our thoughts, our, our fleshly thoughts were, man, like, what, what do they see in her? Like, the answer was that they saw her with very different eyes than we saw her, right? We, we were very much seeing kind of honestly very petty things that annoyed us about her. Right? But the people that interviewed her, they saw something in her. They said, we want to give this girl a president's scholarship. We want to pay for her tuition. And see, this is basically how people are seeing Zacchaeus. They still thought that works preceded salvation. They were thinking, like, this guy has to have his life all together, and then Jesus should accept him. He needs to carry, he needs to fulfill everything in the law. He needs to be perfect. And then Jesus can save him. They thought that God saved those who had it all together. Like they're so stuck on the fact that he's a sinner. They're so stuck on the fact that he's a tax collector that they can't see that there's this new life that is springing up in him right before their eyes. And so let's look at what this new life looks like. Because so far we've seen Zacchaeus has sought out Jesus. Jesus sees him. Zacchaeus responds to Jesus Jesus speaks to him, and then Zacchaeus receives Jesus. So now let's look at how Zacchaeus responds to him. He has received Jesus in his life. Now what's the response? What's the open hands that we see? Verse 8, we see Zacchaeus' response. He stood. He said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. This is what repentance looks like. We've talked before in the, in the book of Luke how repentance is a recognition, yes, but it's also a resolution. There's, there's a recognition of, of my sin, yes, there's, so confession is part of that, but there's also a resolution of, okay, I'm going to make this right. I'm going to address it. And Zacchaeus has a clear view of not only what his sin has been, but also how it has affected others. And so he resolves to address that with open hands. If you remember, all the way back in uh, Luke 4, 4, 18 and 19, Jesus is starting off his ministry in Nazareth. We've come back to this a few times as we've gone through the book of Luke because it's such a pivotal point. Jesus, he, Luke 4, he's starting off his ministry. He goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath. He takes a scroll and he starts reading from the book of Isaiah. And he reads this. He says, he reads, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Like, think on that description, what, what Jesus just read about what, what he's here to do. And then think about what Zacchaeus is doing in response to putting his faith in Jesus. All the way back in Luke 4, Jesus says, this is what I have come to do. And then Zacchaeus does this in Luke 19. Zacchaeus, he's, he's, he's manifesting, he's showing the kingdom of God. We can see the evidence that the gospel has had in his life. Because remember again, back in Luke 4, same chapter, but this is after he reads at the synagogue, Jesus has been healing people, healing their diseases, and they demand more of him. They say, come on, we need you to heal more people. But he says, no. He says, Luke 4, 43, he says, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. And if you notice that word must was there again as well. I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God. It was inevitable. That was what he was here to do. Now, some might have accused Jesus of being uncaring when he chose to preach the gospel instead of address the physical needs of the poor. But notice what happens here in Luke 19 when he does preach the good news of the kingdom to Zacchaeus. What happens? The poor are cared for. Justice happens. Wrongs are made right. This is the natural outpouring of the gospel. These two things do not need to be separate, the preaching of the gospel or the outpouring of it, the results of it. This is what happens in changed hearts. Now, 
Notice the contrast. There's a contrast here that I think Luke wants us to see. This is between Zacchaeus' response to Jesus and the response of the rich ruler in Luke 18, previous chapter. Jesus called him to sell all that he had and give it to the poor, and so he walked away and said, I, I can't do it because he was so rich he couldn't do it. So, and Jesus responds by telling the crowd how difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God, for it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And the people around him are understandably a little bit alarmed. And they say, well, who, who then? Who can do this? Who can be saved? But Jesus says, what is impossible with man is possible with God. Here we see evidence of possible with God. See, for the, for the poor person, the, the leap of faith is trusting that God can meet your needs. That's the leap of faith. For the rich person, the leap of faith is trusting that God is the only one who can meet your needs. Zacchaeus believed that. Zacchaeus was wealthy. He had all of his earthly, fleshly, worldly needs taken care of. But he realized, Jesus, this guy, he has what I need. Zacchaeus, he trusts that Jesus is the only one who can meet his real needs. He ends up giving away half of his possessions and then restoring four times over anybody that he has cheated. And, and, and Jesus heartily approves of it. Jesus is approving of this. And this, this shows what Alan said uh, about the other rich ruler. When Alan was preaching on that, he said it's not the amount that makes the difference. It's the heart. It's not necessarily that he had to give away every single thing. That's not what everybody has to do in order to show. But it's the heart. Jesus was looking for an open heart with the rich ruler, and he didn't find it with him. But he knew he had it in Zacchaeus, and, he res and Zacchaeus responded with this outpouring of generosity that mirrored this generosity he knew he had received from God. He knew that he didn't deserve the favor and the salvation of Jesus, but he received it, and he responded to it. And this is the complete picture of the gospel. See, there are certainly the conditions of, of being saved from, eternally, uh, well, from, from eternal death, being separated from God. And being saved from that, from that state. That is certainly a part of the gospel. We cannot miss that. Because that is what sin does. Our sin separates us from God. And that is our destiny. That is our fate on our own. But it's short-sighted to say that that's all that there is. It's not just being saved from that fate. See, the gospel is not just life insurance. It's life abundance. There is an outpouring of the gospel. Jesus says in verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. And so Jesus connects the recognition of salvation to this, this presence of repentance. Salvation happened because of his open heart, but then it showed itself through his open hands. So his repentance is shown by this, this redistribution and by this restitution that he makes. He, he, he redistributes his wealth to the poor. He makes restitution four times over. And in the process of doing this, he lives out what Micah 6 verse 8 tells us. Micah 6 verse 8 says, he has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. So, Church family, please, please listen. He, hear, hear me on this. Let's not have this unnecessary opposition between what happens in our hearts and what happens with our hands. They should not be opposed to each other. This, this can be a pitfall of Christianity today. Some camps focus on the heart at the expense of the hands. And some camps focus on the hands at the expense of the heart. They focus on the external at the expense of what happens inside of us. Sometimes we also Focus on what happens inside of us at the expense of what happens in the external. So it's not merely praying a prayer to be in heaven with God forever, but neither it is a social gospel that is focused only on what happens in this world. See, the kingdom gospel, it really is all-encompassing. It transforms the heart to see the world as God sees it, to see our possessions as God sees them, to see people as God sees them. This is what happens in our hearts who responds to the call of Jesus. We see it in Zacchaeus' life. So Zacchaeus, he responds to Jesus, and then Jesus responds to what's happening in Zacchaeus' life because when we allow this kingdom gospel to transform us, then we can really understand what Jesus says 
at the end of our passage, which this is essentially a, a summary of the whole book of Luke, honestly, that for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Let this statement sink in. Every word has meaning. There's the great uh, Presbyterian preacher, R.C. Sproul. He has a great commentary in the book of Luke. And on his commentary in big letters, on the front of it is, or is this phrase right here. For the whole book of Luke, that's how he summarizes it. The Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. Look at that phrase, the Son of Man. Jesus calls himself the Son of Man. We saw this phrase a couple of chapters ago, Luke 17. It's used over 80 times in the Gospels. It's always Jesus referring to himself. It points back to Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14, which the Jews of the day would have been familiar with. And this is where Daniel writes about this ultimate victory. Ultimate victory of the Son of Man over sin. Jesus could have said, I came to seek and to save the lost. But he calls himself the Son of Man. Of man, because he, he, he doesn't say just, just me, just I. He refers to himself with his particular phrase, and this particular phrase is tied to his ultimate victory. See, Jesus is victorious. He has won the day, and his victory is not complete yet, but it is sure. We are still waiting on the, on the consummation of his victory as he returns and eternally wipes sin from our experience. But see, what the thing is, he wants to include more people in his victory. And so he is seeking out the lost. We saw this in a whole chapter back in Luke 15. There was multiple examples, the parables of the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son. He's revealing his heart. Jesus reveals his heart, which is the same as the Father's heart. So, you know, whenever you're tempted to have the thought of why does God make it so hard to know him? Why doesn't God make it easier to know him? Think of verses like this, like Luke 19, verse 10. He's telling us clearly what his heart is. He's telling us clearly who he is. The son of man came to seek and to save the lost. His heart is to initiate a relationship, to search out, to relentlessly pursue the lost. A theologian named D.A. Carson. I quoted him a, a couple months ago. He wrote a book called Praying with Paul. There's a, a pastor friend actually posted this uh, on social media yesterday, actually, it, and it just fit exactly what we're talking about here. He, so D.A. Carson wrote this If God had perceived that our greatest need was economic, he would have sent an economist. If he had perceived that our greatest need was entertainment, he would have sent us a comedian or an artist. If God had perceived that our greatest need was political stability, he would have sent us a politician. If he had perceived that our greatest need was health, he would have sent us a doctor. But he perceived that our greatest need involved our sin, our alienation from him, our profound rebellion, our death, and he sent us a savior. So for the follower of Jesus, I have, I have really three things to respond to from this passage. First is you once were lost. That's a very simple statement, maybe an obvious one, but boy, do we sometimes forget it, maybe live as if we forgot it. You once were lost. You were the one who was outside of the family of God. Ephesians 2, 1 through 3 gives us a very vivid description of what our condition was pre-Jesus. Secondly, it's good for us to reflect on the order of things when it comes to salvation. This is, this is important. Jesus sought you out. Like, e even if there was a time where, where you were looking for Jesus, maybe there was an extended period of time where you were looking for Jesus, he sought you out first. See, this, the seeker, we, we think of ourselves as the seeker sometimes. No, no, you were the sought. Jesus was seeking you out. So that happened. You responded to him. You received him, and then you responded to what he had done in your heart. And the order of salvation, the order of things in salvation is so important because it's so easy to get wrong. And in fact, it's so easy that really every other religion, every other worldview in the world really gets this flipped on its head. It says, that, yeah, our, our, our actions, our deeds lead into salvation. But no, this is not the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus sought us out. We respond to him. Our lives are lived for Jesus in response to salvation, not in search of salvation. And thirdly, this is the question, who, who in your life seems unlikely to come to Jesus? 
Who is that person in your life? It just seems unlikely. Maybe they're stuck in their ways. Maybe they're not interested in God. Maybe they're living their lives for something else. Like, let's, let's let the story of Zacchaeus be a reminder to us to lift them up, to pray for them, and to believe that God can change their hearts. With God, all things are possible. This, this is what we saw in Luke 19. And for the one who might not be a follower of Jesus today, I have really one thing to say is that Jesus is seeking after you. Jesus seeks after you. Receive him today. There is no reason to wait. Zacchaeus knew that Jesus had what he needed. He immediately sought him out. When we look at this whole story, we can see the heart of God on display. We see a person who's seeking God with their whole heart and we see that when a person seeks God with their whole heart, they will find him. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Let's let God's word sink in us deeply this week to seek him out. Pray with me as we, as we close today. Lord, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Your faithfulness continues through all generations. And Lord, your word that is relayed to us the story of Zacchaeus, this true story that happened in real life, Father. God, I pray that you would give us hearts that are open to you, open to work, you working in our lives. God, I pray that we, as, as the gathered body of, of Southfield Christian Fellowship, God, that we would just Seek out how we can live out just the implications of the gospel in our lives. God, that we would not let the gospel stay with us. It would not just be something that happens in our hearts, but God, that it would transform us and that we would be the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. God, that we would not have just dead religion, but God, a living and active, be a living and active body that is devoted to to seeing this world experience and encounter Jesus. Thank you for what you're doing among us, God. Give us humility. We, we, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray.